Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode 74 Show and Tell War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Minors. I always wonder what makes one child a murderer when similar children are not? Many kids grow up in non chaotic, supportive households that take a life, yet their similar siblings and friends do not. On this episode of Murderous Minors, We visit Las Vegas and the 1986 murder of Edmonton, Alberta, Canada native James Teedy. His decision to lay low in the desert under the alias Cotton Kelly would lead directly to his premature end due to three local teens. Two of them had known each other since their big wheel days. Sandy Marie Shaw moved from Minnesota, landing in Las Vegas at the age of six ending up one street over from Troy Michael Kell, who was ten. Just a typical neighborhood, all the kids ran around together, growing up knowing they had each other for support. By the time Sandy and Troy reached their teens, she felt comfortable having him in the role of her protector, especially as she experienced shocking events and traumas in her young life. Though she performed well academically and was involved in activities, inside she had become broken and numb. The first life-shattering incident occurred when Sandy was 13 and at the luxurious mansion of her best friend, whose father's business brought Caesar's Palace and Circus Circus to the Vegas Strip in the 60s. They'd invented a whole new kind of Vegas lifestyle. But Sandy was at her friend's mother's exclusive Rancho Circle home, which she shared with her current husband, a brilliant business mind in his own right. Alex Ajed had emigrated from Hungary in the 1950s and ended up at the White House having dinner soon after entering the U.S. He had previously lived, married, and had a family in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, before landing in Las Vegas in the early 1980s. Those who knew him expected him to use his intellect to become a whiz kid. Instead, upheaval in his personal life overwhelmed his corporate acumen, and the events of September 23, 1984 put his name in the media again, but for a new reason entirely. A 13-year-old Sandy Shaw was there that night, when simmering animosities led to multiple murder-suicide. In total four people would end up dead. The couple had been fighting all day, and the lead detective on that case told reporters that Alex had tried to reconcile issues with his wife in the morning. However, the disagreement continued into the evening. He would find Virginia and confront her at a benefit at Caesar's Palace that she hadn't invited him to. Police reported that he told her to get herself a good lawyer, and the couple went on to leave separately. By the time Virginia's friend Betty DeFiore drove her home and prepared to drive Sandy and her friend to a safer location, Alex was already back there where he'd been packing his belongings all day in preparation for the split. Some of Virginia's other friends had come too, including Jack Levy, and the ex-wife of Alex's former business partner, Nina Schwartz. That business partner described Alex as a gentleman, but also stated that he was aware that he had a violent temper with his wife, though he claimed to have never seen that for himself. He said his former partner hated his wife's friends. 
Nina Schwartz was reaching down and thus obscured in the back seat of Jack Levy's car, parked in the driveway, when Alex Ejed exited his mansion and shot the man in the head, before doing the same to himself. Nina was forced to push her friend's body from the driver's seat so she could go for help. Inside, Virginia had already been murdered, as has her friend Betty, shot while standing next to the girls, attempting to shepherd them to a safer location. The two teens escaped the tragedy physically unharmed, but within the year, Sandy would witness a second incident of domestic violence when she watched a stranger chase down and shoot his pregnant girlfriend. The back-to-back -back violent incidents resulted in a PTSD diagnosis and a Valium prescription for the 14-year-old, who found herself lost and detached. Soon after, while hanging out at the teen's arcade at the Circus Circus Hotel and Casino, Sandy would meet Cotton Kelly, who described himself as a 24-year-old entrepreneur with a budding adult entertainment business. He wanted her to pose for nude photos. According to Sandy, the encounter ended with Cotton driving her toward an unknown destination before eventually depositing her at home near dawn. They had no further interaction for eight months until Cotton saw Candy again, this time at a fast food restaurant. He got her phone number from a so-called friend and proceeded to call her family home at all hours of the day and night for almost two weeks. When Sandy's mother contacted police for some kind of help keeping Cotton from harassing her now 15-year-old, they told her that since Sandy hadn't been physically injured, there was nothing they could do. It was 1986, and as we've talked about before, little to no stalking laws existed, especially pertaining to children. So, Sandy set it up, making a date with Cotton Kelly, knowing that the evening would culminate in his being physically assaulted. Both she and her friend Troy Kell are adamant that Sandy didn't know that Troy had a gun. Also along for the evening was 17-year-old Billy Merritt, a friend of Troy's that Sandy didn't know. They all met at that fast food restaurant on September 29, 1986 and the plan was to get Cotton Kelly to the vast desert northwest of Las Vegas. Troy would rough him up, and he'd learn that he couldn't just harass teenage girls. Once they pulled off into the darkness, as part of the ruse they'd preplanned, Sandy exited the vehicle and feigned a slip so that the guys would come running. She'd say she heard Billy Merritt tell Troy to, quote, do it, but instead of throwing punches, Troy pulled out a gun and shot Cotton Kelly six times in the head as he tried to help Sandy off the ground. For a reason that I can't really understand, uh, I decided to bring a gun and shoot the man and kill him. Before being left alone in the Nevada desert to die, 21-year-old James Teedy, whose alias was Cotton Kelly, was robbed of $1,400 and his car. The Edmonton, Alberta transplant had previously worked on an oil rig and was remembered by friends as being friendly and generous. James T.D. was known to use the alias Cotton Kelly, and at the time of his murder, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were interested in his whereabouts. Come to find out, other members of his family used the Kelly last name as well. Their use of the alias and drug trafficking involvement in Canada and Nevada would come to light on the side of the prosecution by the time the trials began, although Sandy and her lawyer would not learn about it for over 15 years. She would say that given her already traumatized mental state, she was unsure the following day if the events of her memory were authentic, and she revisited the murder scene to see for herself. School friends told police that Sandy came bragging about helping commit the murder, saying she claimed to have fired the shot that was meant to end Cotton Kelly's life. They also claimed that she asked classmates if they wanted to go see the body. 
As a result, multiple other teens saw the body in the desert, and it didn't take long for 15-year-old Sandy Shaw, 17-year-old Billy Merritt, and 18-year-old Troy Kell to be arrested for the shooting. The case was dubbed the show-and-tell murder in the press, and local publicity focused on why Cotton Kelly was in the Nevada desert that night to begin with. Sandy was declared the ringleader with the allegation made that she had orchestrated Kelly's death and hired two older friends to carry it out. The presumed motive was robbery, given the fact that Cotton Kelly had won over $1,000 earlier that evening, which Sandy admitted the teens took. Her bail was raised to $3 million as she was deemed a threat to the community. It was the testimony of other teens, specifically Stacy, David, and Thomas, that helped to portray Sandy as a ruthless killer and likely helped convict her. The court heard Stacy testify that Sandy had told her she'd personally participated in the murder and that they'd left the victim's car ablaze, neither of which was accurate. Stacy also told how Sandy had boasted about her actions and smiled when she showed her the body, and that she'd taken friends along on multiple trips to view the body over the week it took for police to be informed. Sandy herself testified as to her involvement in the murder, however vehemently denied ever pulling the trigger, reiterating that the intention had been for Troy Kell to beat the man up. After the first shot, caught the moan and hit the ground. And there was another shot. I'm going to really yell, get him now, Troy, get him now. And at the same time that was being said, there was two more shots. What did you do? There was nothing I could do. It was all behind. It was Everything was behind me. I was on the ground. It was all behind me. So what did you do? I was screaming. The teen also admitted to returning the morning after the murder with Dave and Stacy because her state of mind left her unsure that it had really happened. All three of the teens were eventually offered the opportunity to accept a plea agreement. Sandy's would have had her face the minimum four years, maximum 12 years in prison. Troy was offered life with parole but turned it down, feeling like any sentence with the word life in it was more than he deserved. He opted to try his luck at trial. Sandy Shaw's public defender was on his first criminal trial, and she says that he assured her that a jury would never convict such an adorable girl on such an overblown charge. The state, however, made it a point to instruct the jury to disregard her youthful appearance for it belied a cold-blooded killer. In the end, both Sandy and Troy received life without parole. Prosecutor Dan Seaton stated that he offered Billy Merritt a lesser plea because he found himself convinced the teen had no prior knowledge of the plan. William Charles Merritt served 12 years in prison for accessory to murder and possessing stolen property. Troy Kell moved into maximum security Ely State Prison in Carson City, Nevada at the age of 18 with the attitude that he would do whatever he had to do in order to establish a reputation as a tough guy. It was documented that he soon was befriended by Patrick Charles McKenna, known even then as the most dangerous man in Nevada. Having been prosecuted by Dan Seaton in the past as well, McKenna was now on death row at Ely, having first landed in prison at 17 for kidnap, assault, and rape. He and an accomplice kidnapped a man and his girlfriend, mercilessly beating him and viciously sexually assaulting the woman. Two years into his 20-year sentence in maximum security prison, he escaped in a garbage truck but was brought back, serving the next six months in the almost total darkness of solitary confinement. The day he was released from the shoe, he orchestrated an escape involving seven other prisoners. Shockingly, he was back on the streets a few years later, paroled in 1976. 
McKenna then set out to perform a contract hit and rape the man's girlfriend, which got him sent back in on a parole violation. When he was released again, he shot him.